legal counsel, sent you a memo on the Ukrainian assistance, the security assistance. That memo recommended that the hold be lifted because, number one, the assistance was consistent with the national security strategy in terms of supporting a stable, peaceful Europe. Two, the aid countered Russian aggression. And three, there was bipartisan support for the program. Did you at the time agree with the recommendation of your staff to lift the hold? Congressman, I'm not going to answer questions with regard to the Ukraine situation. Any particular reason you don't want us to know what your response was to that memo? It gets to the deliberative nature of our policy process, and I'm not going to go and relitigate that. But it was a congressional will. You don't think that the fact that congressional will was overridden by yourself had we at least requires some response to Congress? Look, we can disagree on whether it was legal. We can disagree on whether it was good policy, but we at least have to understand why you did this because obviously it's going to impact future policy and what we try to do. We were abiding by the wishes of Congress, the appropriations language of Congress, to, to spend the money as appropriated by the end of the fiscal year. That was wasn't going to happen unless there was a whistleblower. It's not true, sir. So we, tell me why you, tell you why you lifted it then. We lifted it because the president made a decision to, to spend the money uh, at the time that uh, as Congress was moving forward with a continuing resolution at the, in which there were. Uh, so at some point Ukraine they told you what, they told you to lift it and go forward with it is what you just said. The, pr the president, we released the funds. Uh, that is well documented. And uh, it was done with by the end of the fiscal year and would have been done by the end of the fiscal year. Did all the money get allocated and spent to them before the deadline? Or was money, Actually, didn't did Congress have to cure that because it wasn't done in time? As, as you know, we actually did better than than the end of the Obama administration being able to spend money, get the money out. But the you door. didn't answer that question. That money was not all spent, and it took a congressional act to make sure it was a curative act. Correct. There, there was certainly congressional action to make sure that no money was left on the table. But we were ensuring by the right. by the apportionments that we were doing. We wanted to make sure that DOD took every action that they could, short of, of obligation, to make sure that the money went out the door. OMB implemented the hold through a series of apportionment documents. The first of these documents was approved on July 25th by career OMB employee Mark Sandy. Several days later, you took the authority away from him and gave it to Michael Duffy, a political appointee. Duffy signed every apportionment document thereafter, eight in total. Sandy was not aware of any prior instance when a political appointee assumed this kind of funding approval authority. Was Sandy's approval authority revoked because he raised concerns about the legality of the hold? No, absolutely not. And I just think it's, this, is, this conversation is very important to provide context to. Policy level what, give us the context. That's what you didn't want to give well, me. Well, in the area of apportionment and our, our, how we uh, apportion taxpayer resources. All apportionment decisions have supervision by policy level officials, including myself. I have signed apportionments. Uh, I did one this last summer as it pertained to uh, some of the uh, needs along the southern border with regard to whether we were going to have a deficiency apportionment. So these are all, th even though they are prepared in, and signed by career officials, all of them have oversight by policy level officials. In this area of, of foreign assistance, we wanted to have uh, a, an ability to look at every single apportionment, have everyone rise to the level of a policy official so that we can look and to see whether they reflect the policies of this president because he has particular interest in the area of, of foreign aid. And, I, and we we're doing that broadly outside of, of Ukraine. It was, it was all of the defense apportionments. It was all of the uh, international affairs apportionments. And it is something that uh, we believe is managing the federal government to faithfully execute the laws of the country. So if that wasn't the reason, why did you take the authority away from Sandy? We did, again, we Just a elevated. coincidence? We elevated based on a, a larger conversation about being able to have oversight and with granularity into all of these particular questions, and it had nothing to do with Ukraine. But it's just a coincidence that Sandy had it, the authority taken away from him 
just at that particular time. Is that what you're saying? It is a coincidence okay. in the sense that the, the, our elevation took place at that particular time, but it was also in the in in the context of a larger conversation. Did about any other issues. staff raise concerns about this? OMB staff to you. <sighs> We went through a, a, a very systematic process, like we always do with apportionment, uh, and uh, our general counsel's office was signed off on this. Uh, there have been reports in the in the press that we've lost staff. I believe those those reports are untrue. Um, to the extent, were you aware of any staff that disagreed with this policy? Uh, I'm not going to get into staff that disagree or agree that, that gets to our deliberative process and that's something that is some is would have a chilling impact within our agency to be able to allow career officials to to weigh pros and cons of, of a given policy decision. And I'll, I'll finish in a second I appreciate mr. Amade's indulgence based on witness testimony as well as documents released by the administration pursuant to FOIA litigation it's clear that the Department of Defense had escalating concerns about the hold Specifically, DOD officials were concerned that they would not be able to spend the funds before the end of the fiscal year. And in fact, we now know these fears were well founded. DOD was unable to spend all the money before the clock ran out. And yet, in December, on a December 11th letter to GAO, the general counsel, your general counsel, said at no point, quote, during the pause in obligations, did DOD OGC indicate that to OMB that as a matter of law, the apportionments would prevent DOD from being able to obligate the funds before the end of the fiscal year. Given everything that has since become public in the FOIA litigation, the impeachment investigations, do you still stand by that statement? We do. The General Counsel's Office of the Department of Defense was in lockstep with OMB's General Counsel at every step of the way. We're going to disagree again, sir, but I appreciate your, uh, your being here today and answering selectively whatever questions you think is appropriate. Uh, I'll close. Look. I happen to agree with a lot of the things that, that, that members said here today, that there are reasons to justify increases in what you're doing. Uh, that's true for a lot of others. But this is opaque, and when you do things like this, and when you divert funds away and change the work plans for the Army Corps of Engineers, for example, you're really taking away the rights that Congress has and you're subverting that policy. And then you come, with all due respect, and ask for the same sort of courtesy and respect and abidement by the law w when you're not doing it. And it, it's hard for us to take it seriously when you don't have that same respect for the Constitution in this body. But I uh, appreciate your being here, and we'll continue this conversation. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.